discipleship. Hey, Nate. How you doing? Hey. How's it going? I'm not done yet. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not done <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So we are doing a series on discipleship. We're about three weeks in, and yeah. I know he's ready to go. He's excited for this. And ready. As I was thinking about calling him up here and, and just about who Nate is, I just I have such an appreciation for him as my brother in Christ and just the, the community presence he has and the leadership he gives us here and not just here but at Fresh Coast and anytime he goes anywhere, he's a leader, isn't he? And sometimes leaders have a lot on their plate and for him to have the ability and the capacity to spend some time with the Lord this, uh, this week to, to bring something here to us um, is a blessing. And so um, will you guys extend your hand to Nate as we pray over him? Yeah, God, we just thank you so much for Nate, our brother here, a leader in this community, and just all that you have uh, for him and how you're using him and the way you've wired him, the capacity he has to carry uh, great things forward and to, to just move things forward. And so, Father, we pray that you would just use his words this morning and the things he's been meditating on uh, to bless us and to encourage us and to equip us in our journeys with discipleship and, and uh, just the people that we are putting ourselves around to be able to minister to throughout each and every day. We just pray for your favor on this mighty man, this giant here in this community, a giant to me at least. God, we pray blessings and favor this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sis. Good morning. How many of you like this shirt here? We got, yeah, we sold out of these shirts. So we'll have some more here, hopefully in a couple weeks. And one of the things, can you turn me down just a little bit? Because I know once my voice starts picking up, I don't want to scare my mother-in-law up here at the front. I get instructions not to wear hats when I speak for my mother-in-law. So if I do not have my hat on over my ears, because my, my mother-in-law does not like me wearing hats when I public speak, especially in the church, okay? So, like Samuel told Eli, speak for your servant is listening. <laughs> so, good stuff. But we will have some more of these shirts, that, but we have different colors, and once we do, I'll let you know, and they'll be selling them at the training center up the street. So, and we'll probably get some over here that we can have out to, to sell to if people want them. All right. We're going to talk about discipleship. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 4. And now we will build on what Nick and Ray already started. And um, yeah, you know, this was an interesting time, spending time over the last few weeks about discipleship and the idea on how discipleship is one of these things that has, at least from my perspective, I ain't saying I'm right, but I think I am from my perspective is, is that the church as a whole has not done very good with this command that Jesus left with his church. You know, Matthew 28, one of the last things he told us as the church, he, leaving his disciples, you know, he, he says, here's what I want you to do. And the importance of it is you can always look back at the last thing that was told to you. Think about this. Have you ever, I remember, um, my parents, when I was younger, you know, they'd go out on a date or something, and they'd, I remember me and my brother were a little bit rambunctious, and so they'd call, he'd, my dad would call us up to the, before they would leave if the babysitter was there and uh, would say, hey, now listen, do not burn the house down, do not kill your sister, and when you're told to do something the first time, you do it, Okay. The one thing, out of all the things he could have told us, he says, here's the one thing I want you to remember. In other words, while I'm gone, I'm going to return. Here's what, I want you, here's what I want you to keep at the forefront is this. Okay? Do not burn the house down and do not kill your sister. Okay? 
This is the same situation that Jesus is dealing with with his disciples. He says, now listen, I'm getting ready to go. Remember, he said, I'm getting ready to go and prepare a place for you. And then when I return, here's what I want you all to be doing. I want you to continue to occupy the earth. I want you to occupy the place that I've called you to. And I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Disciple nations. And let them know that the kingdom of God is at hand. That it's here. Okay? This is the last thing he tells his disciples before he leaves. In other words, here's an urgency on them. This is important. But when we take a step back, we haven't, we, as, as a church globally, we haven't done a very good job at this. Ray pointed it out last week where a lot of the concepts and ideas are around conversions, people being converted into the kingdom. As that is absolutely necessary. Yes, that's the, that's the doorway into the kingdom. Okay, it's, it's the first step into the kingdom. And you'll notice this, when we talk about conversions, we talk about salvations, people being born again, and it is absolutely imperative in order to be born again. There has to be genuine repentance. There has to be a turning of sin and a sinful lifestyle and declaring God as Father and Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay? There has to be that. But have you ever noticed that Jesus only talked about salvation one time with one person in the middle of the night? You can read that account in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. And he was a Pharisee and he came back and says, I've heard you, you've been talking to people, but how can someone be born again? Can they jump back into their mother's womb and literally be born again? And he, and he had to explain to him, no, this is a spiritual rebirth. It's absolutely necessary. And then after that, listen, every other time he talked about the kingdom. What shall we compare the kingdom of God? What shall we liken the kingdom of heaven? And then he would share a parable that was relevant to the culture of the time on what the kingdom looked like. Just in the Gospels alone, Jesus used the word disciple over 230 times. In all of the scriptures, old and new, the word disciple is mentioned 239 times. Okay? The word Christian is mentioned three times. Okay? Do you think if, if, if Jesus is, is communicating this, if the prophets in the Old Testament are communicating this concept, this idea about discipleship, do you think it might be, it's probably important. It's probably something that the church, us, not just us, but the church as a whole should be given some attention to. Like, oh man, maybe this may be something very dear and near to his heart. And because we're surrendered to the king of kings, what he's interested in, we probably should get interested in too. And so he leaves the church with the, he, he said, here it is. This is what I want you to remember. I want, listen, discipleship. I want this to be not something that you get to when you have time. It's, I, don't, I don't want this to be something that it, when you get around to it, um, do it. But this is my process in people growing up in him. Those who have given their lives to the Lord, this is the process and how they grow in Christ. Now the word disciple, you see, is closely associated with the word discipline. You can see disciple in the word discipline. A disciple is someone who is a disciplined learner. That's literally what the word means, a disciplined learner. Now, when you go in the, in the New Testament, as we see Jesus communicating with the people and even those who he called his own disciples, they were not in any way confused of what Jesus meant. Like today, a lot of folks who are a part of our family are. Not here globally. I'm talking when I'm when I'm saying us, I'm referring to the church of to all of us. Did you know there's a difference between being a Christian and a follower of Jesus? You know that? You can be a Christian and believe in whatever you want to. Now I'm gonna say some things that are probably gonna make some people mad. God forgive me, but I couldn't shake this off last week here. This concept between there's a difference between Christians and followers of Jesus. So you can be a Christian and believe that abortion is okay. 
Okay? You could be a Christian and believe in this whole concept, this, the transgender, where people don't know who, what a male and what a female is. You can be a Christian and still believe in all that. But you can't be a follower of Jesus. Okay? Here's why, because he's not going that way. He's not heading in that direction. And it's not that we treat anyone any different. It's not that we get mad at people. We disown them. We don't honor. No, we still have an obligation as the church that represents him here to still show compassion because people are hurt and they're broken. When you get to the point of getting to that place, there's a brokenness that is probably beyond what most people can actually understand and comprehend in the moment. It's an age-old trick of the enemy. Did God really say there's only male and female? You understand? And when people debate on whether the, the baby in the mother's womb is, is alive, I remember in sixth grade they taught us in science anything that grows is alive. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, there's, 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 and God is for life. He's for life, and he's always going to stand on the side of life. It's our responsibility, those as the church who he's given influence to, is to speak up for those who don't have influence. Now, the, now a Christian could go in that way, but you can't be a follower of Jesus and say that we're standing in that. Now, I told myself I wasn't going to go past three minutes on that, so I'm going to stop. Because I do, I, I, there's, there's a number, some of this stuff at times can get frustrated where we see things. And at times, sometimes it may just be a miseducation. I don't want to say that everyone's heart is just, I don't want to go up and be disobedient to that. No, I'm not, I don't want to say that. And I don't want it to come across that way. Because we've got to show compassion to people. We've got to be able to, and, and many times, and here's the thing, the church has been known for casting the stones and being judgmental towards people. And we've got to own that. They've got every right to think of us and view us in that way. Because we've, as a whole, it may not have been you individually, don't take it that way, but as a whole, we have represented that judgmental attitude to the world. And it's why a lot of people don't even want to come and step in any church house. Because they say it's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, I mean, if they joined too, well, we, we'd have, you know, all, everyone has, has come to a place or been at a moment in their life where their handshake hasn't matched their smile. Or we've said one thing and done. All of us are guilty of that, right? But you guys. But a lot of times it's because individuals, w from their own personal experience, they, we've been very judgmental towards them because we, we've we've shared the truth, but we haven't done it with compassion. The difference. Many times we could share the truth, and if it's not covered in compassion, well, it's going to come across the wrong way, and people are going to misinterpret. And the enemy is going to take full advantage of that to do whatever he can do to turn people's hearts against Christ. So a disciple is a disciplined learner. I think what Jesus was dealing with, we look at the upbringing inside of Jewish culture, something I, I had heard about years or so ago and then came back and began to study it and look into this, is in Jesus' day, unlike today, in Jesus' day, they were not, it was crystal clear what a disciple was. They were not confused in any way, shape, or form. But today, if we ask someone, I remember Ray did this a year ago, he had, put a, he had posed some questions. He had put a, a Coca-Cola, a can of a Coca-Cola up on the screen, and he asked everybody, he said, well, what is this? Everyone said, a Coke. And then he put a picture of a deer or something. He said, a deer. And then he wrote the word Christian up there and says, what is that? And it was silence. And not silence that no one, that majority of people didn't have an answer for it, it went silent because I think internally we know it's going to conflict with everyone else's definition of it. And I bet today if we asked the question, what is a Christian, that we would get probably close to 50 different answers of what a Christian actually is. Well, I want to bring us back to this thought. The word Christian has only been mentioned three times in the Bible. Disciple is 239 times. Jesus' emphasis is raising up on disciples who make disciples that go up and raise up other kingdom-minded people 
Not to draw attention to themselves, but to draw attention to the king. Now, in Jesus' time, there was, it even started even in the Old Testament when in the Jewish culture, they had something that was called the house of the book. It would be kind of equivalent to our today elementary schools. It's called the house of the book. And at the age of five, you would go to the house of, of the book and there would be a rabbi there that would teach the kids. And while they were there during this time, they would stay till about 10 or 12 years old. So they were there about five, five to seven years. And by the time they graduated from the elementary school, they could quote the first five books of the Old Testament. This is where they would go and they would learn the Hebrew alphabet. They would, they, they would take Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And by the time they got out of that, they could quote the majority of the Torah. Now, think about this. Now, this thing, if we pitch this here at Kingdom Life, now, by the time your kids leave our children's ministry, they will have this much of the Bible memorized. Everybody would be showing up. I, I want my kids learning the Bible like that. I want that. But this was just a part of their culture. Then, if you, were, if you were really good and you were stellar and you stood out amongst the crowd, most of the kids at that time at the age of 12 would go off and join their father's occupation. Okay, they would go and they'd become, get into agriculture, get into fishing. They would go join their father's occupation and they would work alongside of their father. The, the girls, their schooling would stop there. At the age of 13, in that culture at the time, that's when, at 13 years old, that's when the girls would be given off for marriage. And so the ones that were the cream of the crop at the top and really excelled in school, they would go on to the next level of learning, which we would call junior high in our day. It's called the house of learning. And when you get there, there would be a paid rabbi that would walk with these students, kind of the best of the best, from the, from the house of the book, they would go into the house of the learning and a paid rabbi would teach them. And then they would learn from everything from Joshua up to Malachi. And they would be here till about the age of 15. So the next three or four years, they would be in the house of learning. And they would learn the rest of the, the books of the Bible up to Malachi. Now, most of them didn't memorize the whole thing verbatim, but a lot of them did. And then at the age of 15... They would graduate from the house of learning. And then the majority of them would go off into an occupation of some sorts, probably go join the family business. And then the best of the best from the house of learning who had a hunger and a desire to want to be a rabbi one day, to want to go into the next level of things, they would, there were certain rabbis that were there to disciple young rabbis who were 15 years old, and they eventually, in time, wanted to become a rabbi. So they would call them, they would have to sit in and do an interview with them. And the only lens that the rabbi was looking through was to see, can this one one day be a rabbi? Does he have the educational rigor? Does he have the emotional stamina? Can he, can he, does he have the emotional stamina to stay with this thing all the way to the end? Because when they would join the rabbi at this time, at the age of 15, you had to leave your mother and your father and you had to go and be with the rabbi and this time usually took till about the age of 30. So from 15 to 30. It's unique that Jesus' age when he stepped on the national scene with his ministry was at the age of 30. And so you would go and there's four essential things that would happen when you would leave your mother and your father, you would leave your family, and you would actually go and live with this rabbi. You had to go and you had to be with him. Do you remember the picture in the book of Samuel when Hannah offered her son Samuel over to the priest? Remember, she took him and said, here, he's yours. And he's going to be raised in the house of the Lord. You'll see different, con this idea is spread throughout the Old Testament. So you'd go and you'd be with him. And then you took the rabbi's teachings, the way he interpreted scripture, you just absorbed them. You came and you, you took his teachings and you just absorbed. That means if he prayed, you prayed like him. If he taught, you taught. Whatever he did, you went and did. So this was not, I want to know what he knows. I want to become what he has become. And if you got blessed enough to come into this thing, 
You were called to come and be my disciples. And the, the rabbi, if he accepted you, he'd say, hey, come and follow me. And the Hebrew word for that is Talmudim. He would say, come and be my Talmudim. And you would go and you'd be with him for about 15 years. And you would learn everything you could about Jewish culture. And then at the end, you're 30, you become 30 years old and you're finishing up your time of being with the rabbi. You were blessed to hear these words. Now go and make disciples. And you would be released to go and do likewise, to do the same. And you would take on the teachings of your... That's why Jesus said, remember Matthew 28, you can see this concept embedded into what Jesus communicated to the people at the end, to his disciples at the end. He says, for I am with you all the way to the ends of the earth. Go and be with him. He says, teaching them to observe all of my commandments. That means... Do like the Talmudim did. You, you, you took the, your rabbi's teachings and you do what he did. In other words, you go out and you baptize people. You do exactly what he said and make disciples of every nation. Go and make disciples. You can see this idea and this concept that he was communicating to the people and what the rabbi, the culture was at the time, what they were going through, what they were experiencing as a culture that he was actually calling them into. Let's turn to Mark chapter 4 and look at this. And once Jesus steps on the scene here and how he communicates this to, to his people. Mark chapter 4. And you notice like in our relationship with the Lord, how we go through different phases of our relationship with the Lord. You know, when we first get saved, it's, it's kind of like a fellowship and a relationship with God. And you ever notice those times when you first come to know the Lord that it seems like he answers every prayer you ask? And it's almost you can kind of get, you just kind of filled with supernatural joy because it seems like everything I'm asking, it just, he's answering. And it's almost like you're, you're in this relationship. You understand grace. You understand why you're here. But then there comes a time where you, you move into discipleship. And you become a disciplined learner. And then in time, as you've become a disciplined learner and you've been with him for a while, you move over into lordship. Where now it's him who sits down on the throne of our hearts and he reigns as king. So in other words, I don't necessarily need someone around me coaching me and, 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 and being on me to help educate me. Once I become educated, now I can go and make disciples, and I move into the lordship. It's like when you get saved, you, you go into, you're almost like a servant. You, you were good at doing the do's and don'ts at the very beginning. It's almost like a natural thing to fall into the do's and don'ts. But then, Jesus wants to move us into friendship. And he wants us to do things and obey him, not because a lightning rod is going to come out the middle of nowhere, but because I don't want to disrespect my friend. I want to I want to stay in good standing with my friend. I want to stay in a healthy and maintain this healthy relationship with my friend. And then once I move from friendship, you move into matrimony. You move into this love relationship where, and then the terminology of the bride and the bride of Christ and the Messiah, it begins to make sense. And he, he compares it to the relationship with um, a, a man and his wife. Uh, the wife is there, and she's, she's in a unique position to know the secrets of his heart. And it's the bride of Christ. Part of our relationship is that he knows everything about us because we're actually living in that transparent relationship with him. And we go through these different phases as we get to a place of, this, uh, of matrimony where he knows us. So Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. No, Matthew chapter 8. Sorry. I'm sitting here looking at it like, where did I? <laughs> Matthew, Mark, no, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. I'm getting the numbers mixed up in my head. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> and we're going to read verse 34. Okay, so here it is. Now, this is Jesus first coming on the scene here. Jesus is coming on the scene. This is the first time he begins to discuss this concept of discipleship. 
Now think about in all these people's minds who are hearing it, they understand that when the majority of them came in the house of the book and they learned the five, first five books of the Old Testament, some of them went on to join their father's occupation. Another group went into the house of learning, but the majority of them, almost all of those standing in the crowd here, all stopped at that place. Most of them standing there stopped at the house of the book. So when they turned 10 to 12 years old, they stopped, they, they stopped advancing in their education. So probably just a handful of them went off into the house of learning. But so think about why he's here. They all stopped at 10 years old. They just learned the five first, first five books of the Old Testament. And they knew that their parents had to pay a rabbi for them to go to the house of learning. And then they knew at the age of 15, if you were going to become a Talmudim, you had to do an interview and get selected to be in this thing. This wasn't just like, oh, I get to go to high school or college because I got the money. No, you had to be selected to be a Talmudim. Okay, so here's Jesus stepping on the scene, and he's about to rock everyone's world. Because in Jewish thought, they knew you had to go through this process. You couldn't just skip the house of learning and come right here and be a Talmudim and just be a disciple without being interviewed by the rabbi. They knew that. Now listen to what he says here. Verse 34. And Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples. And said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Like two things. He makes a distinction between two groups of people. He, there's a crowd and then there's his disciples. The crowd is the group of people who, if we described it, this is the group that just... In today's culture, this would be the group they did, you know, read the Bible when we got some time, go to church when we're able to, uh, we try to do, be morally good, just do good the best we can. That would be the crowd. The disciples are the one who have chosen to be a Talmudim. They've chosen to follow Jesus, okay? Now, here's where he breaks it up and when he says, whoever, anyone, who wants to come and follow me. Anyone, whoever wants to come and be my disciples. And the religious leaders, if they were there at that time, they'd have been like, hold up. Half these people, they ain't even gone through the house of learning. They can't just skip that and come and be your disciple. Like, what are you doing? You're, you're, this is not the way we do things. And he breaks that mode. He comes out of that mode and said, hey, whosoever, whosoever, anyone. you got to remember at this time, there's men, there's women, there's children. And up until this time, there had never been, at least I haven't been able to find, there has never been, at least recorded, a woman who had ever been a disciple of a rabbi. So think about this. As Jesus is saying this, He's saying, look, men, women, children, if you want to be my Talmudin, if you want to be my disciple, come and follow me. He's flipping the script here. Think of the people in the crowd who thought, well, I, I, I didn't think that I could ever become a, a disciple. Now, Jesus was raised up this way. He was a rabbi. So they understood the implications that he was actually inviting them into. He wasn't sitting down doing an interview with anyone. He just said, hey, if you want to be my disciple, come follow me. Come follow me. Come be with me. You remember when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you? That word yoke in the first century, that was what was described as the rabbi's yoke was his teaching. So when Jesus in Matthew 11, Paul in Galatians 5, when he says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, take my teachings as your rabbi, take my teachings upon you. In other words, he was speaking to his disciples. He said, listen, take my teachings. Listen, you want freedom? I'm going to walk you into freedom. I'm not going to bound you by the law to where you're a slave to these teachings that they're teaching you. 
These slaves that you have to, you have to pay attention to the, to the, to the, to the moon, full moon and the festivals and you have to be circumcised. And all of the Jewish culture that was binding people into bondage and not freeing people to be who they were. Because as he looked at Jewish culture, there was a bunch of trained worshipers, but there were not a bunch of free worshipers. And what he was actually inviting them into was to become a disciple who was a freed worshiper. Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, listen, just come to me. If you'll come, I'll give you rest. So he invites them into this relationship of being a rabbi and inviting a bunch of people to come and be his Talmudim. And some of them took him up on that. Later we read that he sent 72 out to go do the work of the ministry. So we know some chose to become his disciple that day. Well, what does it look like to become his disciple? Let's keep it really simple. What did Jesus do? Did we ever see Jesus praying? It's not a trick question. Yes, okay, all right. Did Jesus confront the injustices of his day? Did Jesus serve the unfortunate? Did Jesus cast out demons? How'd that go this week for you? See, look. <laughs> All those straight faces out there looking at me like this here. God bless you. It's just a joke, okay? All right. What did Jesus do? He feasted. Did he hang out with sinners? Yeah. Historically, that was the first thing he was called. Did he teach in the synagogue? Okay, so let's just stop there. Let's just say just those things right there. Each of us are first called to be his disciple. Would you agree? So if we gauge like, okay, well, where am I at with this thing? If I look at just Jesus and I say, okay, he's the one who I'm to be discipled by. He's the one that I'm called to follow. The Come follow me. He's the one that I'm called to follow. You say, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I pray, but I, I could do better. Now, all of us could, right? Remember he said to be part of the, to follow the rabbi, you, you went to go be with him, you followed his teachings, and then you did what he did. Right? And then you were blessed to hear the words, go and make disciples. You did what he did. I think all of us in this room could probably be convicted of that, correct? Right? That there's a lot of things that he was doing that we haven't disciplined ourselves to. That we haven't surrendered over to him to do that. You remember what Paul told the church at Galatia in, in Galatians 4.19? He says, I'm writing to you, my dear children. He's showing effect. He says, now listen, I, 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 I love you. You guys are my dear children. He says, but I'm in birth pangs until Christ is formed in you. And that's part of the good news, is that this process of Christ being formed in us is actually a process. That's why he compares it to giving birth. That's why he compares it to a woman being pregnant. Because he said, listen, it's going to be a process for the fullness of Christ to be formed in you. And you remember, our experience of salvation always starts with the name of Jesus on your lips, but it ends with Christ being formed in us. And there's a process in this thing of how we're developed and how we grow as believers in what we do. The second thing I want to point out about Jesus is that you'll notice the people that he called to be with him were not believers at that time. And many times we have conformed discipleship to just people in the house. When Jesus first went to his disciples and said, hey, come follow me, they, they didn't even know whether he was the, the Messiah or not. So when we use this word, this terminology, disciple, we're not looking at this as just people in the house. But where are the places where you have influence at, of people who don't know him? 
that you could actually invite them into your world, walk alongside of them and do life with them, and actually represent the king to them. That's a form of discipleship. That's one most people probably would argue with about. Like, no, no, no. Well, remember, Jesus is always going to be the standard. He's the one who always sets the standard. Look at his ministry. Historically, he was first known as the friend of sinners. And Jesus spent the majority of his time around people who didn't agree with him. So if that's the standard and the king set the standard, then is real ministry defined when we're around people who actually disagree with us? This here is easy. This, this coming in, when we all come in, we all agree. <laughs> we're all heading in the same direction. There's nothing challenging about this. But the ministry starts when we're around people who disagree with us. That's when you find out what you really got. That's when you find out if, do we actually have something on the inside of us? It's just like you could tell what you have. Anyone, you can't tell what you have when you're in front of a crowd like this. You find out and you discover what you actually have on the inside of you when you're one-on-one. -on -one. Because you have to give explanation to things. You have to actually live it out and you got to actually be with them. And you actually have to give yourself over to people. In a situation like this, you can come in here and, you know, you can razzle and dazzle the crowd and then be gone and be home by 1 o'clock by the time the Detroit Lions come on. Right, Nick? Because they're going to the Super Bowl this year, aren't they? We're going, baby. <laughs> but we can, we, can, we, we can come in here, and all of us, all, everyone who stands up here, so this is not the true test, whether me, Nick, Ray, or whoever gets up here, Bob, that we can just come up here and do this. It's not the true test. It's what's happening outside of this. This is just a, one part of it. You know, who are we being discipled? Are we being discipled first by Jesus? And then are we living in community and being discipled by others who are further along than us? That's the practical side of it, right? And it's not in going out and creating a new event that we actually invite people into. It's just inviting people into what you're already doing. That means just inviting people over into your home to have dinner. That means if you're going somewhere, it's, it's just, let, hey, being, you're thinking intentionally about bringing people with you, doing things so that you can be with people. There's kind of three ingredients I think of and when, you th when I think discipleship. Everyone has to, people have to have access to you. You have to be near to be able to pour into people. It can't be just dip in, dip out. And you have to be able to give some of your time up too. And that's probably one of the things that most of us don't like to do. We don't like to give our time up. Or we've been drained by giving too much access of ourselves to people, which is very real. There's a stewardship and boundaries that have to be in place. But when, when all this is done, we're not going to be able to say, hey, I didn't have enough time. I didn't have all this because Jesus is going to want to deal with us with the last command that he sent. He said, listen, this is the most important thing to me. Did you make yourself accessible to the people that were around you? Did you give your time and were, did you live in proximity and nearness with the people? Right? There's people sitting in here that I, the Lord, if we ask Holy Spirit, is there someone that you would like me to, to draw close to? It could either be you, you're at a place where you could actually disciple someone or you could be at a place to where you need to be discipled and you can recognize that. And you need someone just to come walk alongside of you and do life with you because they have a healthy lifestyle and you're surrendering your life over to them that works both ways it's not just this group over here needs to come and find this group but this group here needs to go and find this group it's where we can bring the two generations together those who have been walking with the lord for a while and those who are just coming into the faith where they can walk alongside of each other and actually do life together and learn from one another
living in community. Because many times it would be we would just want to protect our own, our own space, our own this. I don't want to invite people into this. I, I, want, I, don't, you know, I don't have time for people. And if that's not the case, it usually becomes portrayed that way, that we don't have that. But as kingdom citizens, we have to, we have to invest into people. We have to draw people close to us. We have to first be living it out in our own lives, and then we have to be able to pour it into the next group of people. Because most things, most things are caught, they're not taught. And people, as they're just around us, they're going to pick up the things that need to be picked up. They're going to be around us, and they're going to see, okay, is this, is this, what, what is their prayer life like? And these are opportunities we actually get to pray with them. We get to ask them, get into their business and ask them what they got going on. We get to ask them, how is your marriage? How is your relationship with other people? How's your integrity going? And you actually, not to see if people are doing wrong, but to hold people accountable to what they're actually called to. Sometimes it's, you get too close, it can get scary. It gets scary close, and we, sometimes we don't like to be in a relationship like that. But if we're going to grow, we need a couple people. We need some people that can actually pour into us, people that we trust, people that we value their opinion, people that we can recognize they got something that I need, and being able to draw close to them and to walk with them, do life with them, that's what it's going to take in order for us to come to a place to where we can live before him, imitating him, and representing the king here on this earth. This call, can I be a Talmudin? Can I be a disciple? Can I be the one who can come and, and, and walk alongside of the people, or can I come walk alongside of the people and actually learn from them and what they're doing? And Jesus wants to call us into that. You look at this from a spiritual sense. Mothers and fathers without a purpose will raise children without a destiny. And many times the passing of your legacy and your destiny will be the people that you bring up behind you. Now people are following us all the time, whether good or bad, whether we want them to or not. People are paying attention to you. It's one thing we can all say the right stuff, but if the handshake doesn't match the smile... And in the end, we say, okay, well, how many people did you disciple? How many people did you bring alongside of you? How many people did you pour into? If that's the last thing he, he left us with, that's probably going to be possibly one of the things he's going to want to discuss with every single one of us. And no one's going to be standing next to us asking us if that was the key. Now, this, is an, this is an important thing. This would be an urgency. And I think many times, and we've been discussing this, and we're going to, we're going to put together an actual packet that helps people in this process. Because many times I've talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people about this at conferences and wherever. They go there about discipleship, and many people don't even have a concept. And some of them have been pastors for years. So I could imagine if the pastors are battling with that, what those who may not be necessarily in the ministry or whatever you call it, or just that may just may not be a part of their everyday life. If someone asked you, do you have anyone who you're pouring into right now consistently? You know, you'd have to ask the question, well, no, I'm really good with my convictions, but that's about it. Do you have someone that you're pouring into that you're drawing them the attention towards him and bringing them to a place where they're actually living in relationship with, with the Father? Those are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And it's not to be crude or mean, but we have to ask ourselves, okay, this is what the king said. This is final authority. Am I giving attention to this thing? Who can I point to? I can say, okay, I'm, I'm walking alongside of these young men or young women or whoever it is that God's called you to. Or people, it doesn't even have to be young. It could be people who you're just walking alongside of, that they've just come into the faith. Can all of us point back and say, okay, yes, I got some people that I'm intentionally pouring into. If we can't do that, if you can't do that, if I can't do that, then we've missed the mark somewhere. Something Something, it's, it's not a failure thing. It's just that we just got some growing to do. And we need to give some attention back to this, to this discipleship piece. You know, that's, the king said it. So if the king calls us into these relationships, these be, need to be the things that we give our attention to. Let's stand up.
let's just, you know, let's just take, you know, this time. I want to, and I really want to be, have this be a time where we're actually asking, say, Lord, is there, am I really discipling people? Or am I just showing up to church on Sunday? Am I, am I giving attention to what you called us to do? Am I saying, you know what, you left us with this. This is the last thing you had to talk with us about, so it must be important, or it wouldn't have been the last thing, the last instructions that you gave us. So I think it's all of us say, you know what, man, you know what? I've been walking with the Lord for some years. I got something to give away. Or you may say, you know what, well, I'm not very versed in the scriptures. Well, do you know him? Don't get to a place to where you, well, I haven't memorized enough verses before you get to a place to where you can disciple people. If you got the word of God, you got it. You take it with you. And if that puts a demand on you having to get into the word to discover what the scriptures say about whatever the thing is that you, you, you're having to address in that moment, then do that. And there's no excuse. Not, it, there, we're not going to be able to say, hey, I didn't, look, I didn't know. I, you know, I, didn't, I only memorized John 3.16. So I didn't think I was that valuable. No, you are that valuable to the kingdom. He's called you to change the course of world history, not only for you, but for the people around you. And the fear of, well, I don't know enough of this. I don't know enough of that. I'm not that well behaved. I'm not that. None of that matters. What has God called you to? So before we pray, I want you to ask yourself, all of us in this room, say, hey, you know, my God, are you calling me to disciple people? Or are you calling me to be discipled? Because I don't want to get to the end of this thing and just realize I've just been a good Christian. <laughs> and the few times that it was mentioned in the Bible was mentioned in a derogatory way. So it wasn't that God, oh, I'm going to call you Christians. No, they were doing that making fun of them. He called us disciples to be disciplined learners. Let's just take a couple moments and just, let's just ask the Lord. And we ain't here to play church. I ain't in with all that play church stuff. This is the real thing. And let's ask him. Say, look, man, if I'm off, I'm off. And there's no judgment if you just ain't there. You just haven't stepped into that part of your walk with the Lord. It's in the relationship. You've been in the relationship piece. Now it's time to go into discipleship. I just, let's just ask the Lord and say, man, where am I at? Do I need to be discipled or are you calling me to, to disciple? Now, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would come through and, and minister to our hearts this morning. That if we're in this place where we need to be discipled, that you would highlight that to us. Or if you're calling us to disciple, this is, this is a time where you're saying, hey, I want you to give attention to what's close to my heart. I want you to draw close to the last thing that I told you. And if he highlights someone to you, we need to set up a time to, to connect with that person. So Holy Spirit, we just release you now to do what you do. That you would uh, highlight to us whoever we need to be discipled by, to maybe to, to build in relationship or to be discipled. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that right now, Holy Spirit. We thank you and we bless you, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. If, that, if, someone, if, 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 if Holy Spirit highlighted someone to you in this room to connect with, go do that. And this fall, we're going to be, especially for the men, this fall, we're going to be having a men's gathering September 14th. It'll be um, every Tuesday night. We serve dinner, and you're going to come, and you're going to meet men who've been walking with the Lord and those who are just coming in. You're going to meet everyone. But this is a, this is a perfect opportunity to come and build relationships and, and really see who's who, who's doing what. Who's in, who, who you can invest into or who, and I guarantee you're going to meet someone there who could invest into you. And you're gonna, there's going to be men there that are going to want to pour into you, that are going to want to invest into you. Okay? And we have to be intentional about this. 
Now, the day we, we look at the, where things are at in the world, <laughs> the one thing that's lacking is a group of people who really believe what Jesus, the last thing Jesus told them was to be a disciplined learner, to be a disciple. And as men, we're here not just to, just to get saved and be as good as we can and go to heaven, but we're here to co conquer and take territory, first in our own hearts and literally conquer and take territory here on the earth. And we're the ones that God's called to be, run point in our families and to run point here in the city. This is our responsibility. Maybe you go back to Genesis 1, the, people that, the, the, the person that God left in charge was Adam. And when this is done, he's coming to check us. Did you, did you men do what I called you to do? Did you do what I told you to do? He's coming to talk with us. And it's our responsibility to be here and raise up this next group here. The next group that's coming behind. The next group that probably grew up without a father in the household. The next group that's coming by that don't know nothing about the word of God. I don't know nothing about living in relationship with Jesus. This is our responsibility to do this. And so Tuesday night starts September 14th. I want to, if you're available, if it's not work or something mandatory, I'd love to see you out there where you can connect. And then that Thursday, that week, the women will be getting together. And the same thing. As we see the women get together, you're going to meet women who have been walking with the Lord for years, and you're going to meet some who are just coming in. Some are maybe in the fellowship stage, don't know it. But listen, everyone has a role to play in here. Don't show up to every Sunday morning meeting. Don't show up to every Tuesday night, Thursday night expecting to get fed. Sometimes you've been walking with the Lord. You know how to feed yourself by yourself at home. You should come looking to pour in and give away what you have. Don't place all the responsibility. Oh, I'm not getting fed there. That's, that's about as close to sinning as possible. That's not the preacher's responsibility to do that. You never see a shepherd going and feeding any sheep, do you? No, the shepherd takes them to the pasture. The sheep feed themselves. Right? That ain't the shepherd's responsibility. So we get, this is something we, gotta, we, we have to take this seriously, this discipleship thing. And we're not worried about what everyone else is doing. We're going to be worried about what's going on in our house and coming along and walking alongside of each other and raising people up. Amen? All right. Father, I thank you. Bless you, Lord, for each of these people, each, this house, Lord, and I ask that your face would shine upon us. And, Father, that you would uh, wake up on the inside of us this, your heart for discipleship and what you've called us for. And, Father, we thank you for the responsibility of being a light in the midst of the darkness here in Muskegon. And so, Father, we thank you for what you're calling us to, even beyond this house. So we bless you, sir, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you may leave and go and change the world. <laughs>